Let's build this permanent magnet DC motor together. We'll mostly be using a coffee can and some wire. If you look at the armature, or the part of the motor that spins around, you'll notice that it has one magnet pole on this side and another magnet pole around here on the other side. Therefore, it's called a two-pole motor, and it's the simplest kind of DC motor. This particular motor can run off of a single 9-volt battery. Smaller motors like this one typically run on a lower voltage than larger ones do. Here's what all you're going to need in order to build it. First of all, you'll need a coffee can. They're mostly made out of stainless steel, but there are a couple of obscure brands where they use aluminum. You want a stainless steel one. Basically, if it's magnetic, it'll work fine. Then you'll need some wire with enamel insulation. I'm using 26 gauge wire, which is about a half millimeter in diameter. You'll need a wooden base about 10 centimeters on a side. The one I'm using is 10 centimeters by 8 centimeters, and it's 6 millimeters thick. Next, you'll need a shaft. A metal coat hanger works well, cut to about 10 centimeters long. We'll need six screws to hold everything down. I'm using M3 screws. To make the armature, you'll need a non-conductive cylindrical tube. This is a PVC tube, one centimeter outer diameter with one millimeter thick walls. You'll also need either some sheet copper or a copper tube about a half millimeter thick. I found copper tubing that's one centimeter inner diameter that can fit snugly around the plastic tube. Then you'll need some epoxy putty that bonds to metal and some insulating tape. You'll need two magnets. Neodymium magnets two centimeters in diameter work well. Finally, you'll need a battery and some clips in order to test it later. In terms of tools, you'll need some tin snips to cut up the coffee can, a saw, a hole punch or small screwdriver, a ruler, a large screwdriver, pliers, a mallet, and either sandpaper or file. Let's go ahead and get started. First, we'll make the commutator. Let's cut about 13 millimeters off the plastic tube and then about 23 millimeters from the copper pipe. Since the copper is not too thick, it's pretty easy to cut. We're going to cut it into four equal strips, but we're only going to use two of them. We're going to make three five millimeter cuts on each end of the two copper strips. When you're doing this, you have to be really careful not to accidentally get your fingers between the blades. These cutters are really sharp, and I'm having to apply quite a lot of force here. The two outer fingers will hold the copper to the tube, and we'll use the middle finger on each end to make an electrical connection. Once we get both of the copper strips attached, we can mix up a bit of epoxy putty and stuff it into the plastic tube. Then we can run the shaft through the middle of the putty. We're going to want the center of the tube to be about 27 millimeters from the end of the shaft. Now we've finished making the commutator, and we can let the epoxy dry. To make the rotor, we'll need to cut two pieces of steel from the coffee can, 36 millimeters by 20 millimeters. You need to be really careful doing this because the metal could cause a bad cut. Then we'll fold them along the dotted lines 8 millimeters from the ends and place them back to back with the motor shaft running through the middle. Use the tape to hold it in place. Scrape the enamel off the end of the wire and wrap it around one of the commutator segments. Now, when wrapping wire around the rotor, it's important to keep the weight balanced. You don't want more turns on one side than the other, so I'm going to wrap 22 turns on one side, then 22 turns on the other. 22 turns on one side, 22 turns on the other, and again twice, giving a total of 88 turns on each side. Let's connect the other end of the wire to the commutator. To hold the shaft in place, we'll cut two steel pieces, 75 millimeters by 20 millimeters, and fold them with the pliers along the dotted lines. We'll punch holes where you see the black dots in the diagram, and then screw them in place onto the wooden block. Let's make the brushes now and screw them into place. Finally, we need magnet holders. We have a folded design here to make the magnet holder strong and prevent too much vibration later.
this diagram roughly shows where you'll want to screw in your components to the wooden base. When you put the magnets in, make sure you have opposite poles facing inwards. If you were to have two north poles facing the rotor, for instance, then it won't work. Let's go ahead and try it out. The design is basically scalable. If you build everything smaller, then you won't need as much power to run the motor, but you'll also get less torque on the output shaft. It runs pretty well from a single 9 volt battery, but if you have trouble getting it to work, you might need to adjust the brushes so that they don't press too forcefully against the commutator. By the way, you're going to want to make sure that the commutator is lined up so that the poles of the rotor are vertical when the commutator makes electrical contact like this. You don't want them to be horizontal because then the motor wouldn't have any torque. It was running fine off of a 9 volt battery, but I'm curious to see how this motor will perform when we put a higher voltage on it. I have a DC power supply over here that can give us up to 300 volts. Let's go ahead and hook up the motor and give it some more power. I'm going to go ahead and turn on the DC power supply and start it at 25 volts. We've got quite a lot of sparking from the commutator. Let's turn it up to 50 volts. I can smell a bit of a burning smell right now. I better turn it off. If you look at the brushes and the commutator, you can see that both of them have turned black. That's caused by oxidation, and of course, that's not very good. We can fix this problem, and we'll do that in the next video. Another problem with this particular motor is that you have to kind of give it a spin in order to get it started, because the brushes are not automatically making contact with the commutator. We'll solve that problem, too.